Hi, I'm Stephanie Bendixson and welcome to Move. This is our very first episode of our very first series. We're going to be looking at some pretty awesome tech and people behind self-driving cars, drones, artificial intelligence, and of course, flying cars. I've always wanted a flying car. And, and guess what? It's, it's not science fiction anymore. It's actually here. We've, we've even got one today right here in the studio. I am absolutely thrilled to be taking you on this journey with me. So let's get into it right now. When you think about it, moving ourselves over vast distances at great speed has been one of the greatest achievements of humanity. From wheels to wings to winged keels, many of the world's most significant breakthroughs in movement have come thanks to our mastery of transport. But it comes with a cost. Even at the close of the 19th century, people were seriously worried about the side effects of transport. An editorial in the Times in 1894 predicted that in 50 years, every street in London would be buried under nine feet of horse manure. But in a couple of decades, the Great Poo Crisis was averted thanks to the invention of the horseless carriage. Nowadays, moving billions of people and all of their stuff is creating different problems. And we're starting to hit the limit again. Recently, over 10,000 drivers in China experienced Carmageddon as they suffered gridlock stretching over 100 kilometers, stuck for nearly 10 days straight. I mean, the only thing that could have made that worse was if they were under nine feet of horse poo, maybe. <laughs> so how do we design a future that puts us on a pathway to sustainable mobility freedom? Well, who better to ask to imagine a world beyond gridlock then prolific author, Silicon Valley investor, and tech evangelist superstar, Guy Kawasaki. So Guy, welcome back to Australia. Thank Great you. to have you. So we're here talking about the future of transport. What are we realistically likely to see happening in the next few years? I can see the edges of autonomous driving. Uh, I can see all of that happening. And I can't wait. This kind of changes to transportation is going to fundamentally change the world. Houses don't need garages anymore, right? The, the downtowns of everywhere in the world, you don't need parking lots. And if everything is electric, charged via renewable sources, arguably it'll be bigger than the internet. I mean, it really, this is going to be humongous changes until we get to teleportation. <laughs> I won't be alive, so it won't matter. So we're looking at change, yes. and we're looking at how we help people adapt to change. And what are some of the ways that innovators, do you think, could help with that problem? I think it's going to take maybe a decade to get people to believe in autonomous driving and not owning a car and all that. And it's clear that that's gonna happen. When I got my driver's license, I waited, you know, just from the time I think it was like 12, I was thinking, when can I drive, when can I drive, when can I drive? My generation driving and buying a car was a humongous deal. I have three boys and a girl, but the two boys that are driving, they're 25 and 23. They weren't exactly in a rush to get a license. If all these 15, 20, 25 year old people were lusting for cars that they wanted to own, they don't have that attitude, which means they're gonna whip out their phone, they're gonna call their autonomous car, they're gonna get in the car, get out, they don't care. That's good. That's, uh, that's something that you don't have to undo a habit. Let's project ourselves a little bit. Let's go into the far, far future. Say 2056, what does that future look like? It's got to be true that by 2056, we have fully autonomous electric vehicles, few or no parking lots, very few people own cars, no garages in houses, in new houses anymore, or at least now the garages are used as places to make startups, not store cars. Maybe there's more startups because more garages available. With renewable resources, think of all the changes that's going to make. It's going to be a beautiful world. So one of the starting points in designing new technology to solve old problems is the courage to imagine a different future. We're joined by two studio guests today who are here to help us not only imagine, but realize that futuristic, trafficless city of our dreams. And it may be closer than we think. Please welcome smart cities expert, Asha Kugati. <laughs> 
And beside her is someone who is helping to build some of Australia's greatest startups. Please welcome the co-founder of Blackbird Ventures, Nikki Chavez. So now you're both involved in imagining and investing in future cities. Paint me a picture of what that may look like for us in the near future. I mean, how close is a flying car in my life, really? I think a, a flying car is technically possible, but obviously there are great consequences to a flying car going wrong. Uh, uh, so I think, you know, further sort of iteration on regulation and the coordination of all the different stakeholders besides the people just providing the technology um, means that, you know, it's likely to be a number of years away. And then I think also how technology like that is adopted. Obviously, you fly over spaces that don't have lots of city infrastructure underneath it in the beginning, and then you work your way as you prove your safety record into denser and denser urban environments. Um, however, I think, you know, driverless cars or autonomous vehicles um, have a much nearer time horizon. You can fly to Phoenix, Arizona today and hop in a uh, Google vehicle without a driver uh, in a um, even today, and uh, I think sort of 2020 is the time when you'll be able to go to a major metropolitan city uh, somewhere in the world and, and hop in a vehicle without a driver, uh, if you so choose to. I've heard this uh, concept of a smart city. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, so for us, smart cities are about enhancing the consumer experience and making sure that data plays a role in ensuring that consumers have access to all the things they need, like public transport, financial inclusion, um, digital inclusion as well. And Asha, obviously it takes time to develop new transport solutions. So what kind of groundbreaking startups or, or innovations have you seen happening in the space around the world? At Mastercard, we've seen things like um, the payments being inserted to mobility as a service. So that meaning that you can connect your journey. So if you're going from point A to point B, you have the ability to use a number of different transport forms in the process and have, that, and have the payment for that journey take place at the beginning of the journey and not having to get a card out of your wallet and use that on the way. Yeah, fantastic. And Nikki, Blackbird have been recently invested in the automated vehicle startup space. Have you had any test rides or been involved in that yourself? Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, uh, we're an uh, early investor in a company called Zooks and the idea of Zooks um, is to reinvent the idea of a car from the ground up. So no steering wheel, no rear view mirror. It feels like a living room on wheels rather than um, a traditional sort of car where you're sitting four by four with a steering wheel at the front. Um, as I said, uh, you know, these vehicles are starting to be proven out uh, in cities like San Francisco, uh, Miami, uh, Phoenix, and, and so on in the US. Um, you know, it's, it's the companies testing those vehicles with their staff members and other members of the community. But um, again, uh, sort of the, the ethical question of should we allow humans to drive once we know that robots are 10 times as safe or 100 times as safe or whatever threshold you want to uh, sort of pick, um, it becomes like a terrifying idea uh, that we would even let humans drive vehicles. I mean, as you said, it seems like the next logical step to have driverless cars, but does it mean more cars on the road or, or less? I think it could mean more cars on the road, but less congestion. And what I mean by that is um, even just the idea of parking a car, so if we didn't allow any cars to be parked, um, on our streets and we had uh, a fleet of robo taxis driving around. Um, uh, those two lanes and the outer lanes of each road are now freed up to carry additional passenger vehicles. Um, the only reason a, a car is as big as it is today in terms of the form factor is that it's a petrol combustion vehicle with a big engine at the, at the front and a big boot at the back. Um, the steering wheel takes up a lot of room and the safety in a car is really tied to uh, the car being able to um, uh, sort of help the driver in a crash situation between not hitting the steering wheel, which is the most dangerous part of the car. So if you take all of that out, you can actually make much smaller vehicles. You could make little pod vehicles. You know, lots of car trips only have one person or two people. Um, so again, you could have uh, double the road infrastructure if we didn't allow people to park cars. Um, and we could have different form factors of vehicles such that there could be four times as many vehicles and still the same, you know, space on the road being taken. But do you think the key to solving congestion is changing the way we move or changing the way we live? Um, I think it's a little bit of both. So I think things like extending business hours and ma making sure that people are not traveling to cities just at peak hours and leaving at peak hour. Um, work will become something we do rather than the pace we go, which will mean that to some extent we can stay home and work. So we have the opportunity to reduce people in the public transport or on the roads by, by virtue of that. 
Um, and then I think also ensuring that there are additional options for people to travel in a connected way will help as well. So thinking about the here and now, I mean, I live in the Blue Mountains, which is quite far away, and I, I love it up there, but I don't want to lose my connectedness to the city. So what sort of transport tech do you think could bring us closer together? I think um, obviously roads um, by air, uh, Elon Musk obviously ha has an idea around um, sort of using tunnels under the ground. Again, sort of this, um, you know, extending the concept of sort of the long haul uh, traffic uh, and the point-to-point -point kind of or Sounds hub and expensive. spoke model of um, <laughs> different things. Um, but again, uh, you know, even uh, the idea of catching a taxi from the Blue Mountains to Sydney, you know, might seem horrifying in a week's paycheck. However, as the technology gets cheaper and cheaper, imagine if that costs three dollars, not three hundred dollars. Um, I think people again would sort of open up different places to live. And I think also technology will start to allow you to share that journey with other people. So the cost will be borne by you know not just yourself if it was if there was a taxi available. Yeah, amazing. So when people think of future transport technology, it's easy to imagine fantastical new modes of moving. But there's a lot of tech behind the scenes that's radically transforming the transport we have right now. One mover in the field, Josh Phillips, uncovered some interesting AI innovation happening right here in our own backyard. Let's take a look. Technology has been changing the way we move for years. With automation, driverless cars and flying taxis on the horizon, there's still one mode of transport that doesn't have to deal with traffic jams and has been running on electricity far longer than the Tesla. It's the good old train. In 1831, the first cast iron fishbelly railway line in Australia was built. Over the years, different trains evolved, but the process of laying down tracks was critical to the foundation of modern day mobility. Today, it's all about laying down tech tracks, and I'm about to go into the very nerve center of these trains with brains to find out who or what is controlling this invisible revolution happening right around us. The Rail Operations Centre, or ROC, is a brand new state-of-the-art facility powered by AI and is responsible for moving hundreds of thousands of people every single day. We have a lot of AI technology in this room. The screen behind me is the only one of its kind in the world. Not even NASA has the same technology we have on that board behind us. We have new incident management technology that allows us to respond and recover to incidents much quicker and we also have predictive maintenance and predictive failure so when something goes wrong on the network the uh, controllers will get a, a good view before it fails for them to be able to respond to save that incident. Recently we've released our data to app developers to come up with a smart innovative way to, to inform our customers in real time about how they can get around our network. So customers can download an app They'll give them all the information they need that's been taken straight out of this room. So if we have an incident on the network, the app will tell you the best way to travel. It'll tell you how long the incident's going to be for, and it'll tell you how you can get to your destination a lot faster if you follow this way. This is our on-time running at the moment. Green is good, obviously. Uh, and this is like peak time right this now? Is, this is the heart of the peak. So Between how many eight people will be on the railway network right now? As in customers? Yeah. Close to half a million. Wow. This sophisticated centre is jam-packed with technology uh, that will allow us to run this railway for the next 100 years. These smart trains still run on physical tracks, which require routine checks and maintenance. Paul Atkinson runs a team that does this using another kind of technology, drones. G'day, Paul. How are you going? Good, thanks. Now, we've heard a lot about trains with brains. Mm -hmm. If there's a problem on the rail network and I need to phone a drone, are you the man to call? I sure am. Awesome. What have you got here? A small little DJI. Lovely. Do they get any bigger than that? They do get bigger than that. You got one you can show me? Sure, let's go have a look. Let's check it out. Now that is a drone. Yeah, that's the big brother. That's the DJI M210. That's really our workhorse. The camera there, that's a 30 optical zoom camera. So what that allows us to do is to inspect an asset or, or a piece of equipment like we're standing in front of it. The main benefits of using drone technology in the railway is for efficiency and for safety. And it also gives us recordable evidence because the, the data is, is recorded and saved. The train network will continue to be improved for many years to come and is still one of the fastest and easiest ways to get around. Well, until the flying taxi is invented, that is. Well, there's no doubt that changes are happening all around us. And pretty soon we'll see some innovations which could dramatically transform the way we work, live and play. 
What's exciting for me is that we all have a part to play in creating a world where we can move freely without damaging ourselves or the planet. Because let's face it, no one wants to be stuck in traffic for 10 days. That's all we have time for. Please thank Nikki and Asher. And thanks to you for watching. I'm Stephanie Bendixson. Until next time, keep on moving.